very important to remember. What happens to the wicked? They remain in their grave. The wicked that are alive pray for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the Lamb. They are slain by the brightness of His coming. So, what happens if you take all the righteous living, the righteous dead who now have been resurrected, and you take them up here, all the wicked are slain by the brightness of His coming, and there is nothing left on this planet. Jesus goes back, takes the righteous with them to heaven for the thousand years, the millennium, right? They're back wherever God's throne is in this universe. What's the condition of this earth? It is empty. It is desolate. It is broken down. Who's the only one here? Satan and his angels. This is why it says in the book of Revelation that he is chained to the bottomless pit. If you look at that word bottomless pit, it is the same word that is used as abyss. It's the same word that is used as the spirit hovered over the deep in the beginning of Genesis. Because that's the condition of the earth. Right? It is without form and void. There's something here. Like you said, there's something here. But it's not an inhabitable planet. Right. After the thousand years has ended, Jesus comes back the third time. Amen. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, what John sees at the end of Revelation, as a bride, or as a, yeah, a bride adorned for her room, comes down, lands where? On the plain of the Mount of Olives. How can you have a plain that's a mount? <laughs> because before the new Jerusalem lands on it, the Mount of Olives is flattened out. And so this holy city comes down, right? And it comes down now. The righteous, where are they at? They're in the New Jerusalem, right? So when it comes down and lands on this earth, what does God do for the wicked? He raises them up one last time. And this resurrection of the wicked allow Satan to be loosed from his chains. Right? And why is he loosed from his chains? Because now he has people that he can deceive. And this is the gathering of the great battle of Armageddon. Right? Satan is loosed. He sees the vast majority of their numbers. There are so many of them that they're able to encompass the entire New Jerusalem. You know how big this thing is? It would fit on states. Okay? 1,500 miles square. 1,500 miles square. This way, 1,500 miles. This way, 1,500 miles. It's huge. But there's enough wicked that they're able to totally encompass that. And Satan says, look at our numbers. We can overcome them. And if we take that, how prideful can you be? God just destroyed it all with the brightness of His coming. How are you going to defeat it? I asked that question, Way. Is, is, is he's supposed to be really intelligent, right? Yeah. And somebody gave an answer, a really good answer, and that is that, as you said, pride God, messes yes. with your with your mind. Yes. He has no other choice. I mean, this is it. This is the last, this is his last hurrah, the last battle, okay? If we can take the city, we win. Now, how many of you have heard the teaching that there is a eternally burning hell that has been burning apparently, I don't know when it started, but it had to start sometime after the fall of Adam and Eve. They never tell you the, the, the beginning of it. They just tell you that it burns forever, right? And that if you are sent there, you're going to burn forever. Where is hell at? If, if it burns forever and it lasts forever, where is it at? It's got to be somewhere in God's universe, right? But if the Bible tells you that God will eradicate sin and it will not raise its head a second time, if there is an eternally burning hell wherever it's at in the universe, that's where all the sin would be and sin would not be eradicated. You would have eternal sinners. Isn't that what God 
did all this for, right. so he could make sure we wouldn't be eternal sinners. Amen. Why don't you think about this and think this through? When God looked at Adam and Eve after they ate the fruit, what did he say about the tree of life? He guarded it so that they wouldn't eat from it and live forever as what? Well. Eternal sinners. If you had an eternally burning hell, you would have eternal sinners. That's what he actually gave his son so that we wouldn't have that. Amen. Amen. Okay, so. When Satan rallies his, his forces. Now think about this. You're going to have the greatest generals in all of human history will be there. Led by Satan himself. And you have angels that are with them. Angels that excel in power. Okay? Now, this is the, the, the sequence of events. It's kind of strange, but they go and they go to attack the city. God's glory comes from that city, and at some point they're stopping their tracks. And at some point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. But you need to understand, it doesn't stop them. Because as soon as they get off their knees, what are they doing? They're going right back to attack the city. Hell is when God rains fire down from heaven onto them. And it destroys the wicked. It destroys the earth. Okay? It melts everything except for the new Jerusalem. And do you realize... And I believe God did this for a purpose. Do you realize that you will get to see God create the world again? Amen. From the way it was in the beginning of Genesis, the earth was without form and void. From that condition, God will recreate the earth the way it was supposed to be, and you will get to see it. There will be no more atheists, there will be no more evolutionists, there will be no more disagreements of how our origins started. Did you have your hand up? Did you forget I'm wrong, but when, when, when the Lord comes, he, he takes his right up to heaven for the, for the Holy City for a thousand years, right? After a thousand years is over, then the city comes back to this, comes back to this earth. Yes. And then, and then, this is when the wicked will all be resurrected. Satan rises about to come up against them. And yes. And fire comes down. So we'll be we'll be floating along on on a lake of fire, really. And we'll, this is some fantastic stuff. We're going to see him recreate this whole world. Everything. You'll see him create everything. Can you imagine God speaking and trees come forth? God speaking and animal life comes forth? Amen. And again, there will be no questions of, well, I'm not sure how that happened. Or... I don't really think it happened this way, or that, that's not really what the original says. More glorious than Eden. <laughs> but I want you to understand that, listen, Satan has full sway over these people. And he gets them to march on the city. And it is the glory of God that once again that stops them in their tracks. And during this time, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. And it is only after that when all the righteous are able to see that everything that God has done, even to the destruction of the wicked, that He does it out of love and He has the right to do it, Amen. that God finally sends final judgments. In their own mouths they confess Jesus to be Lord. What does that mean? That means that everything that He has done and what He's about to do, He's just in doing so I bring you back to this and let you know that everything that God is about to do here, God is just and righteous in doing. They scoff at kings, they scoff at princes, and are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and they seize it. Then his mind or his spirit changes and he transgresses and he commits offense. Ascribing this power to who? His God. Now understand that God isn't raising the Chaldeans up because they're more righteous. 
God's not raising the Chaldeans up because he likes them better. God is raising the Chaldeans up because he's got judgment in store for them. It's going to be even worse than the judgment he's using them to send onto Judah. Okay? Understand that there is a bigger picture being played here. Judah had the opportunity to walk with God. They had all this light, and they chose to reject it. The Chaldeans didn't have that light. And they became a very powerful nation that God was going to use, but God was going to bring judgments upon them because they ascribed all of their power to their God. Amen. It says they have no excuse. No excuse? Are you not now, God ends his speech to Habakkuk. Habakkuk now starts speaking again. Bless you. Bless you. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, O Holy One? See, it says, we shall not die. Do you know what it originally said? But the translators thought that was kind of blasphemy to have that. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One, you shall not die? Translations say we. Because the translators, they just couldn't accept and they didn't feel comfortable with putting you in there. So look, you've got the King James, right? Where is it? Well, yeah. You won't find that in any translation. You'll find we. It should be you. Are you? What did you say? Are, you, are thou not from everlasting, O oh, oh Lord my God, my holy one, we shall not die? We. Like I said, it's actually you. You shall not die. Oh Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. Oh Rock, now you have appointed them for judgment. Who's been appointed for judgment? That Habakkuk's talking about. Is he talking about Judah? Or is he talking about the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans. Because Habakkuk has to sit here and accept what God is going to do. But realize that God has a bigger plan. It's not going to end just with Judah. Okay? You have appointed them for judgment, O rock. You have marked them for correction. You are of pure eyes and to behold evil, and you cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish in the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them. And this He's talking about the Chaldeans right now. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dry net. Therefore, they rejoice in their plan. Therefore, they shall sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dry net because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? Listen, I want you to see how, how Habakkuk ends this. Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2. This is him speaking. He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. What's a rampart? It's a high place on the tower. Okay. So what he's doing is he's going to go up there and so he can see everything. And he's going to see how God is going to work. Okay. He accepts what God is going to do. He does not understand it. But he doesn't have to. The just shall live by his faith. Okay? I will stand by watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am what? you got to love Habakkuk because Habakkuk knows God. He knows his character. He doesn't understand why this is going to happen. But even though this happens, he still knows God's character. And so he's waiting, and he'll watch and see when he is corrected. Okay? That's where we're in today. Our closing hymn is hymn number 249.